how can it benefit you to design your business intentionally to do the work that you want and be truly selective in who you work with? I'm Lydia Lee and welcome to this week's Corporate Escape Story where I speak to inspiring people who have left their nine to five to create freedom-based businesses to support them in living the life that they want. And if you're new here, welcome, welcome. And don't forget to hit the subscribe and the notification bell button to be the first to know when every video hits this channel. Today, I am talking to Ali Gummert on how she designed her business after starting a business out of experiencing burnout and depression from her corporate life. Um, Ali is the owner of Duet. She's an email marketing strategist and a conversion copywriter who helps online business owners make a killer first impression through automated welcome and nurturing sequences that engage readers, build brand loyalty, and optimize conversions for sales. So in this interview, Ali and I talk about how she built a business that helps her maintain her well-being and what she did to niche down her services and her audience to serve them in a much more effective way. She also gave, gave us some really wonderful insight on why email marketing is actually your most valuable marketing asset for an online business and how you too can build long-lasting relationships with human-focused conversations. I'm excited for you to jump in and the interview. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. I know it is evening for you, morning for me, and we're in summer and winter clothes. So yes. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show today. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm excited Ooh. to have this conversation. I know when I kind of, you know, I'm a big follower of yours and your brand and your and your email list. So when I've been reading a lot of your your stories and sort of how you help people and I'm like, you know what, I really need to get Ali on the show because I not only love the work you do, which we're going to talk about today, but I kind of I really love the way you've approached how you do business, right? In a way that is your personality type, which is what I'm all about. Uh, let's kind of keep honoring who we are, right? As we do business. Um, and so as we, st as we start these sorts of conversations, I like to ask something personal to kind of kick it off, uh, which sure. might not be a question you've been asked before in other interviews. Uh, but my question I love to ask is, how has your family and cultural background shaped your identity? And how has your own personal identity shifted as an adult? Okay, yeah. I mean, the first one that comes to mind, I'm a Midwestern girl. I grew up in a town of 115 people in small town Nebraska. Um, so the, the hard working, the hard work ethic is definitely just part of it. It's like you show up, um, you don't expect others to do your work for you. Um, so that's that was ingrained in me, probably from my father. I can just, oh. he doesn't, he's a man of few words, but it's like, Allison, do the work, like stop complaining and just do it. Um, so that's probably where that came from. And then as an adult, I've actually had to work through that. Um, I tell you what, like business ownership is like, it's the biggest shift in your mental game. <laughs> the, the, I don't know. I've never been married. Maybe marriage is, but like, as far as the first, it goes for me, owning a business has had to require a lot of emotional and mental change. And so for me, hard work, while such a good thing can just be another source of like productivity and getting burnout mm. out because you don't actually know how to rest or when to say, Hey, I've actually done enough. So that's actually been something I've been working through over the last few months of like, what would it look like to be unhurried for the things that don't need to be done today, not getting done today, which is a complete shift from my upbringing. Of course, like my hard work ethic is what has gotten me here. So now it's a matter of reversing that a little bit to find a healthy balance. Mm, I love that. And I, and I have a very similar background. You know, my, my parents were immigrants from Malaysia who has instilled in my mindset. It's like, you better work twice as hard as everyone else, you know, because we have to make it here, you know? Uh, and, and I too am very thankful for that, that sort of work ethic because I, you know, like you, it sort of brought me places, but it's kind of almost knowing how to balance it to go, okay, I can activate that when it's the right circumstance. And then when it's not working anymore, I can also activate a different, more easeful part of me, right? Right? Where it's like nothing maybe needs to be this hard, you know, that you don't have to sweat blood and tears to get somewhere, right? right? <laughs> oh, for sure. Like, I'm that girl, like, it would just be the end of the day. And I'm like, where did the last hour go? Like, what was I mm. doing that I needed to feel productive? So I just kept clicking around when in reality, I should have closed my computer and gone for a walk. And my life would be a right. lot better. <laughs> right. So, you, you mentioned to me that, you know, your, your, 
instigation or your the thing that instigated you, you know, to start your own business kind of came through a burnout, right? And then mm-hmm. depression. Um, mm-hmm. And this is also very similar to how I started because I didn't know when to stop. So it need, my health needed to take a toll and put me down in order for me to kind of have a wake up call. Um, so what happened, you know, in the sense of you felt this burnout and depression and, and almost when we think about burnout and depression, the last thing we probably are thinking about is starting something new and, you know, putting our ourselves into uncertainty. Um, sort of what happened there to sort of give you that kind of fuel through something uh, as like a depression and, and burnout to make you want to be an entrepreneur? Oh, great questions. So leading up to things, I was actually working in video production. I'd been there for five or so years, but I'd also been building a blog on the side for a year and a half or so by the point that one of my best friends was starting a business. And I just, in the evenings, I was kind of consulting with her and giving her in, like, input for fun, you know, and it just, between that and then my day job, um, which I had been doing cold call sales for like the majority of the year. And so that didn't help. Plus I went through a breakup. Plus I had to move mm. twice in three months. So like things were just kind of piling on. Also that fall, I had to get glasses for the first time as an adult. I was like 28 and I'm like, all the that things. Was the, that was the final straw. Can I tell you a quick story? I went yes. to America's Best for my glasses, for my fitting. And I can't even do it with a straight face. The person like has me put the glasses on and I just look at it, look at myself in the mirror and I go, so this is what I'm going to look like. <laughs> like for the rest this of my it. life, I have to wear glasses. Like that had tipped the scale. Like every, it sounds so minor, but by that point it was like, oh, I can't do yeah. anything. <laughs> like, yeah. What so, else do you have for me life? <laughs> what else? Right. And so there had just been so many shifts and changes and I wouldn't have really known it was depression if I didn't have a friend pointed out. Um, mm. cause it had kind of been over the course of the next year. So still while working a little bit part-time in my old job while working alongside my friend and her new agency. So about a year of just kind of everything being in limbo. And then in August of 2018, I started my business. And at that point is where I would have noticed that it was really more depression. And my friend noticed, she was like, you're taking good care of yourself and all these other things, but my emotional peaks and valleys were not really there. Everything was just mm. kind of low. And as somebody who is like a really like happy go-getter, um, I'm really grateful for my friend. She works with um, postpartum moms. And so she's like, this is something that I see. It's not necessarily like a deep, dark depression where um, you can't get out of bed, but it was something that needed to be addressed. And so I was really grateful that she pointed that out. So for me, I actually ended up Um, my friend who wanted to start an agency and like build that together, I actually turned her down and she's one of my very best friends. And this was a very tough conversation because we'd always said in college, we'd want to start a business together. Um, but I had a lot of reasons why I didn't want to, namely being that she was like married and having kids and I am single with now six houseplants, five at the time. And, you know, like that looks really different for co-owners of a company, um, and especially if I looked at the future of that company and being like, you're, you're going to have kids going to college. I might never have kids going to college. And we had to decide like how to spend money in a company. And I ultimately told her, I was like, our friendship is more important to me than starting this business. Like, I never want to not have you in my life. And if this will risk yeah. that, let's not do it. So that's why I started my own business. Um, largely because two, between the two of us, we were both consuming guru information from different gurus, right? Like one of us is over here with Jenna Kutcher and I'm over here with like Lauren Hooker. And like, and so it was just a lot of ideas in one place. And I think having had my blog, I was really game for like, I want to see what I'm capable of and applying what I've learned. Like, I don't necessarily need someone else. Like, well, it would have been great to have her on my team. Um, She ended up getting a job at a hospital. She's great. She's fine. And she has three beautiful children um, who I love. So yeah, I was able to kind of just kind of spread my wings and see what I was capable of. And Mm. um, the first two months of self-employment, I didn't sleep very well. So that's where the antidepressant came in. Um, But yeah, there's like, there's the groundwork. What questions do you have for me? 
Yeah. And I mean, you know, you, you before we started this recording, uh, you know, we were talking a lot about our love for therapy, you know, and that, mm -hmm. you know, we think that we we get therapy when we are in the lows, like to the point where this is now urgent. And then, right. I, you know, I've really learned from having a decade's worth of a relationship with my therapist is that actually seeing her when I'm not in the lowest is when mm -hmm. the best work is done because I have the capacity to do it, you know, and, right. and it's almost like a maintenance. Like, you know, you bring your car in every three months. I don't know, I haven't owned a car for almost 10 years, but you bring your car in for maintenance, right? And a tune-up yeah. and an oil change. But we don't do that as often in our in our human tune-up, you know, because we wait for when things get real bad. And then and it's so much harder in a way to get out of that place when you're emotionally so, you know, grief-stricken already. Right. And for me, it was, I had, you know, I spent the first year and a half of my business, like kind of relying on other people or relying on my business coach. And it kind of got to the point, if I'm honest, where it was like, I could either pay her more to affirm all of my choices and to tell me I was doing a great job all of the time, or I could go to counseling and figure out why I wasn't able to really tap into that permission myself. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so I've been in therapy for the last year. Um, I just got the nod of like, you can come back in when you need to see me. And I was like, I graduated. Are you saying I graduated? <laughs> um, and so, you know, anything that makes it feel like a celebration, a year of really hard work um, mm. and going like twice a month in having those conversations, but it was worth it, you know, because like I said, business ownership is such a mind game too. It's mm. like, oh, I didn't realize all my insecurities were being laid up on my virtual assistant. Cool. So that's why I was crying. Maybe that's something I need to address and it has nothing to do with her, you know, <laughs> like, um, but thank God for therapists. Yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, I always say that the first year of business is like 10 years of therapy. It's like everything is sort of right there in your face. And if you are into growing your, yourself, I think I, I can't think of another vehicle that really brings all of that out for you where, you know, what you do in your business is how you, you do life, you know, in a lot of other ways, but it's almost so obvious, you know, because it's right there in front of you and you get to see it because in our day-to-day -day lives, it's, it's sort of hard to, to be conscious sometimes when we're in that sort of mundane or routine style living, you know, we're kind of seeing the same people doing the same job, going to the same gym, eating the same food, that it's actually hard to kind of think outside of like, hey, is there anything here that is not working for me anymore? Because we're mm -hmm. sort of on autopilot, right? Um, I want to talk a bit about how you insured, because I know one of the things that, you know, I didn't learn from the, the first time I had a burnout and, a, and, and depression and a health scare was when I was in corporate. And of course, I got a therapy, a, a therapist and so forth. But I didn't at that point really think that deeply about decisions I had to make in my business as a new oh, yeah. entrepreneur to ensure that I don't come back to the same place, except that I have no one else to blame but myself because I'm the boss, right? And so it didn't, it wasn't until my third year of business that I had my second massive burnout as an entrepreneur, that that was the only time that I went, wait a second, I have to really think about how I'm showing up for my business that is mm -hmm. bringing me this unhappiness and, and, and dissatisfaction. Um, but you might have been a little smarter than me and thought about this more in the <laughs> beginning of like maintaining your well-being. Um, like, did you, what were some of the, the, the healthy, you know, conditions that you committed to in yeah. order for your business not to, to bring you to a place of unwellness and depression? <sighs> I have a few that are coming to mind and I'm so excited to talk about them. Um, so before I forget, so you can remind me, one is how much I charged Two was the kind of work I did and three were the kind of clients I worked with. Okay. Oh. So um, I had seen friends who were virtual assistants and working at nine o'clock PM because they right. just had like 12 hours work a day. And I was like, that's a no, like just knowing off of like coming off of, you know, a, a lot of uncertainty the year before, and then kind of going out completely on my own. I was like, I can't afford to just, I can't afford to work that much and not have a social life because that's what gives me life. Right. And I don't live like a crazy social life. Like I go to a coffee shop like once a week and I'm like, yes, relaxation. Um, I don't live anywhere near a beach. So maybe that's a problem. I should just relocate. Um, so I came out of the gate. I remember having this conversation with my dad. Like I'm, so I'm from a super small town. My dad's name is Steve. And I remember being like, dad, I don't know. Can I charge like $60 an hour? And he was like, 
or I said $60 or like, what about 75? Is that too much or something like that? And he goes, charge $75, Allie, you should do it. And I was like, okay, Steve, on your dad. Like, he doesn't know anything of what I do. Months later, he tells people, he's like, well, she's good at computers. That's, that's my, <laughs> that's my job description to my dad. But just like, so I had that encouragement, but for me, charging a higher base rate was for me, a way to protect my time. And little did I know, it also protected me from tire kicking clients who just like, the thing is, if you don't charge enough, like if you charge less, you get treated worse. It's like a science. So I don't know where the curve is, but it was like $75 an hour did it. And that's like what I was basing my projects off of at first. Um, then secondly, it was the type of work I was doing. I had thought about being an online business, uh, was it an OBM online business manager? Yes. Um, because I did project management and video production. And I've always been really good at managing teams. And I love creating templates, like nerd level 10,000. Like that's where I'm at. But when I really thought about it, if I'm an operations manager for three teams and they all have five employees or team members and more, that's 15 people expecting to hear back from me or that I need to reply to, or I need to be available to. And I was just like, huh, no, like hard pass that's too many variables. Like I was like, I just, I can't have that many variables because I can't have anybody expecting that much of me. That sounds terrible. Right. But it it reminds me too of like early, the first year of business, I like basically Saturdays just laid horizontal on the couch. Like it was just a straight up recovery day. And I was like, if any friends want to see me, they come here. Like I can't be anywhere at a certain time wearing certain clothes and act like having to be upright. Like, it's just not going to work. So it's the same kind of thing. It's like, I can't have people expecting too much of me because I don't know when I'm, you know, when my limits are. And so, yeah, setting that base price. Um, and then the kind of work I did. So I ended up doing email marketing. And so that was something where I could really niche down to, uh, and it only took me a couple months to realize I didn't want to do OBM work Mm. and I couldn't be a general marketer talk about stressful. People are like, Oh, you do marketing. Can you get me on like Google? And can you right. like run a Facebook ad? And can you rewrite my website? And you're like, Oh, marketing is like big. There's a yeah. lot here. Um, and Definitely. I studied advertising and marketing and they only teach you about agency life. They don't, you know, talk about like, if you're a one person show, maybe just pick right. a specialization. Um, and so I ended up focusing on email marketing And that was something that I had a little bit more control over. And even then I only do automated email sequences because I Mm. can't live with launch stress. Maybe for my own business, but not for somebody else's. Like if that email goes out the wrong day, I will just be in a puddle of despair. Like I can't have that. And then lastly, I also, yeah, picked out, I say this, picked out really great clients to work with. And by that, I mean, I rejected people that I knew weren't going to be a good fit. So I had some people early on, like this, the first week of my self-employment that was like, Oh, this would be, this would be a fun project. And then (laughs) somewhere in the interaction, your gut is like, no, this person might be a little cray cray and make my life miserable. And, and I just had to say to myself, like, I was basically saying it to her, but in my head, I was like, lady, I am no worse off, literally no worse off by not like not working with you than I was a week ago when I didn't have a business. Like it's not worth it for me to risk my mental health and how you mm. might make me feel like crud if yeah, just because I just because I need a project. It's like I would rather wait and just work with people that would really appreciate the work that I'm doing. And so oh, I, to I, this I day I have I've never worked with a PETA client. Like I love wow. all of my clients. Yeah, I mean, that is such a a great boundary to start with, because I think we have this misconception in the beginning because we do want clients. We're desperate for clients and we want our business to work so badly that it does feel natural to just go, oh, you want to give me money? Like, okay, let's just take you on. And that's almost our only metric that we're measuring a client on, you know, (laughs) is will you pay me, right? Right. But uh, it's so good that you brought up that there's so so many other ingredients I require from you, because uh, to me, clients are like you're about to date for a few months or a few weeks or for a while Mm -hmm. you know and so that energy especially if you're someone that is really committed and invested in the work you do for your clients like that relationship becomes pretty deep you know and it's Mm -hmm. and 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 they can um you know keep you up at night if it's someone that isn't treating your boundaries in in a healthy way or respecting your time or themselves are pretty desperate you know and needing things really fast and there's not realistic expectations to that it can really affect the way Mm -hmm. you enjoy your work and you know it, it sets the tone 
alone. And I know this because I was on the opposite side of the spectrum is that I didn't have boundaries when I first started a business because I was a people pleaser. And I just, you know, as my mother said, work hard, take whatever you can get. And so when I, you know, acted in that, that pattern of behavior, I remember thinking, I don't think I'm cut out for entrepreneurship, having that misconception because I, it was so hard to show up for work. And, and little did I realize was actually about, you know, I was now, if I took, if I say yes to this client, what it's actually doing is it's setting the tone for what right. to expect or what I'm willing to do to get a dollar. And, and that was something I didn't realize till a little bit later on, but you know, that is such a good point to make that even when you're starting from the beginning, be very consciously selective of who you want to date as clients so that you are building the environment and the ambience of what to expect or what you're willing to do for, for, for profit. Right. Right. Well, and then part of it is if you do need to work with people who aren't an ideal fit, give yourself a timeline and say yeah. like, Good it's going to be for two months or three months. And then I can turn them down as a client because what you're also doing is you're filling up your schedule and your capacity and your creativity meter, mm. right? How much you can yeah. actually like functionally create and, and manage in your mind um, by having those clients that aren't a good fit. It's, it's blocking that from you getting clients who would be a better fit for that. Mm. So Love like, that. And, and that's just like, I literally said like, we are literally human resources. Like there's only so far we can go and stretch. And so for me, like my emotional engagement, like I really want to love my clients and I do. And it's everything from like financial planning to like SEO. It's, that's just showing how nerdy I am. I also have clients who like write about lasagna. Like it's just, it's all over the place, but them as individuals are people who see what I do and see that it's valuable. And also like when, when my clients sign on, it, they pay within like an hour, 50% down mm. on like a f over $5,000 project. Like these are people who are not, they're not here to penny pinch. They're not here to right. like talk me out of something or change my packages. They see me as an expert and they go, well, if that's your process, we'll do your process. Like there's just no questions really. Mm. Um, and that's how I know it's a good fit too, because I do, I do love leading the process for them. Email marketing is not easy for people to understand. They don't know where to start. And so like I am, I'm guiding them through the process and they trust me when they come into my doors that that'll be the case. And so there's a mutual respect there. Like I respect them as the subject matter expert and the one who knows their audience best, but I will guide the process on making sure that everything mm. gets completed. Yeah. What I love about your business, you know, when I when I first went on your website is is how easy it is to just know what you do and who you do it for and how do I get on that bandwagon to get your help, right? <laughs> so like that simplicity of what you offer and I and I want to talk about niching down for a minute because this is a topic that is super fuzzy and confusing and there's so many friggin' ways to niche down that yeah. we get so overwhelmed by that term that we don't even understand what it means anymore. So I kind of want to talk through like what it is that you had to kind of reframe in your head. Like maybe it was about just making that choice of like email marketing. Uh, and how did you know that that was, did you have to work with a few people and sort of a range of general services to kind of go, that seems to be calling my attention. Like, you know, how did you know it was email marketing and what did you do specifically to niche down so that you can simplify your service packages, because you do have yeah. more than one, but they do make logical sense in what you need and when you need it and so forth. So talk us through that thought process about niching down for you. Well, first of all, thank you for the affirmation. I'm glowing. I don't get to spend that much time around people. So it's not very often that people compliment me on my website. Thank you. Um, oh gosh. Well, let me tell you, it didn't happen overnight. Um, it, so when I had been working with my friend and even in the blogging space, when I had my own personal finance blog, like I, loved email marketing. And so my friend was the one who was like, she was taking on gigs knowing like, well, Allie will handle the email marketing. So she was taking on projects under her agency, passing them off to me. And to me, it just felt like another thing until it just kept happening. <laughs> and more and more people were like, you realize that this is not as easy for everyone as it is for you. And I was like, okay, mm. okay. I hear you. And that was usually like one of the triggers, right? If people are coming to you for things and something that comes easy to you is not wrong. Like just because it comes easy to you doesn't mean you can't charge money for it. Amen. Um, there's, right. There's a lot of mindset stuff around there for, and then for me, um, I read, well, I listened to the first, maybe two chapters of book yourself solid on a treadmill one time. And I took notes and that's all the further I got through the book, but he talks about how like you can serve one audience really, really well. And once you become saturated with that kind of 
client and that kind of work, then you can expand into other markets. But it's a lot easier to be known if you stay concentrated. Maybe that's a better word for it than niching down. So for me, it was the personal finance space. So there's a big conference called FinCon. I've been going as a money, like a hobby blogger. Like, let me tell you, I just love to laugh because I'm like, my friends have cooler hobbies. I'm like, I want to go to the coffee shop and write about mint.com and go to my personal finance conference. (laughs) Um, But we're all learning how to run online businesses. And so I had a lot of connections that way. And I'm just that person who goes and talks to strangers um, at a conference. And so that was my space. I was like, how do I serve these people well? Um, But that was like fall of 2018. And I still wasn't really convinced that like bloggers are my niche and automated sequences are my niche. I was like, I'll just help you with email. And at the time, you might find this interesting, did not call myself a copywriter. I probably didn't call myself a copywriter until about like 10 months ago, to be honest. Um, And I, at the time I'd only done strategy and implementation. Like I liked the tech setup and I liked being able to kind of cast a vision. And um, I ended up taking an incubator. I paid $5,000 for it, which feels like a bit of a boomerang. It's like, you're new to business and you did this, but I bought it from um, a woman who is really well known in the email marketing space. She used to work for ConvertKit. And I just invested in that because First of all, you have nothing to lose. Like when you're first getting started, every new program you take, you're going to learn 100% of it will be new to you. So it's like, now's the time to spend $5,000 if she's going to teach me how to run an email marketing business. Like that was the offer. It wasn't how to show up on Pinterest. I knew that money, money comes from clients, not from selling products when you're first getting started, right? Because I just like, this is just like the huge warning sign of like, everyone's going to try and sell you something. Make sure it's actually aligned with where you want to take your business. Um, Mm. And so in this case, it lined up really well. And I was like, I can learn from this woman. I've been following her on Twitter for years. And I did. And everyone in that incubator, I swear, everyone was like e-commerce or SaaS focused, like software as a service. And like months later, I'm like, I think, I think I'm going to serve bloggers, but is that wrong? Like no one else is talking about bloggers. And it took me months of just like piddling, piddling, piddling. And then I, when I really thought about it, the people that I'd been working with from the personal finance blogging space, like none of them had automated sequences. So I specialize mm. in welcome and nurture sequences for bloggers, content creators, you know, authority builders, community builders, whatever that might be. And, and when I thought about it, it was like, they literally just have nothing. Like there's a huge gap here. They're just sending a broadcast email, but they've done nothing to nurture this relationship. And then the more I've started working with them within within that niche, I'm really seeing it. It's like, man, Mm. you could be segmenting your audience. Like you have beginner personal finance stuff here and advanced investor stuff here. We need to make sure that's going to the right people. And so I just came in and did like a little clean sweep. (laughs) And then like, yeah, so that's how I ended up picking out my niche. Like I had the blogger space. And then after I was in it for a while, saw, um, this particular part of email marketing, because for me, like I get excited. I call it the duet debut. That's yeah. I love it. Show hands because it's like, this is your debut to your new subscribers. How do we craft this so that it's really clear who you are, why they came to you and how you can solve their problems and what resources you have available to them, whether it's paid or a blog post, whatever it is, and that you can build relationships with people. And that all of the people on your list are getting the same experience, no matter when they've joined your list. So that is the full story of how I ended up serving bloggers with welcome and nurture sequences. So it's super niche down. I'm like yeah. niche down in multiple ways, both in my, like the types of clients I work with. Um, and then the type of work that I provide. So like, I don't do, yes. I'll, 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 I don't really do launch copy. I'll do evergreen sales copy, but I don't do anything that has to be sent out live because your girl's anxiety can't handle that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that, that is a very good reason to say no to something, you know, just yep. because it's, it's marketable just because it's profitable because obviously launches are profitable and they would pay you a, a great, beautiful penny, you know, to do yeah. that. Right. Uh, but it's sort of, it's about, do you want to do it or, at all? You know, because it just can't be about whether it's a profitable offer, you know, it has to be, am I going to have fun doing it? And I think, you know, your, your niche is so it's already just in that space is already uh, so, so necessary. Right. You, you, and I think the thing about the abundance mindset as well versus the scarcity mindset of like, believe, that I have to offer so all the things under marketing in order to get a client because they want more from me, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think your mindset is about, well, if I specialize in something instead of being a generalist, then I'm actually going to give you more value and get more uh, stuff done for you because I'm all about this only, 
Yes. Right. And like, I have clients coming to me and it's so interesting. Most of the clients that come to me are like, I'm finally ready to do this. They've thought about this for years. And like, I just happen to be available and ready to do it. <laughs> and, and, and then the way that I can serve them is like, I don't need a nickel and dime any, anyone. And I want to, like, I'm big into making sure that my clients understand how their platform works and understands how to, you know, get the most of it. I work my way out of a future job, like essentially, because I've got it all set up and I'm like, and then you just tag emails onto the end and they're like, okay. <laughs> and so like, I don't know, it, it's, it's not something that I feel like I have to like squeeze more and more out of them. I mean, that's also, I guess we haven't talked about this. I'd base my client work on projects and not retainers. And that's also Ooh. maybe an important yeah. thing to point out. Um, because I don't know that for me, there's a, there's an open loop that needs closed when it comes to working with a client. And so sending a, a retainer invoice is just hard for me mentally and emotionally hard for me because I don't know if I've delivered enough. Like, mm. I, I think this is the Midwest daughter in me. That's just like, have you done a good job? I don't know. Have I delivered everything that they've, that I've said? I don't know. And like the, and I didn't want to do it by hours because I didn't want to like be tied to my desk. And so I set up my, my client work by project. So that way I know when I'm ready to send the final bill, it's because it's done and I yes. can rest at night and know like it's completed. And yeah, that gives me so, so much peace of mind. And I've just got a, I've got a spreadsheet where I keep track of like who's starting when, um, and then how many people are over schedule, <laughs> which happens. Um, but yeah, like that's also just part of like, I'm working through a project. These are the eight different weeks and where, where are we? What are the steps that need to get, get us from A to B and know that the project is complete and that they feel good and done too. And then they don't have to commit month to month forever. Like, so that's another boundary. I'm not creating people's weekly emails. Ooh. I mean, I'm creating 15 of them, but I'm not creating them on a week by week basis. You know, I'm right. creating the automated emails that are most important that everyone gets. And then I teach them how to take their month, their weekly emails and then repurpose those. Yeah, I and love that happy. you do that because, you know, it, it's, it's an expectation that people have when they hire you. It's like we start here and we end here. And there's mm -hmm. understanding of what that value is, you know, and, and for you as a service provider is is knowing when you stop, <laughs> when mm -hmm. when is the boundary of when you stop. And, and it also supports you in creating a bit of a framework, right, a process yes. of, of what you take every client on. Because I think that is one thing that, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of freelancers and people that sort of do service based work um, will charge hourly instead of sort of value-based pricing. And, 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 and that is hard for them to have a system around what right. they do for work because every client is unpredictable or every project is different in some way, right? And so it's really hard to have templates, really hard to have a checklist, really hard to know that spreadsheet, right, of the eight things you have to do for the client when every client is going to be sort of we can start here and then we might end there, you know? So I love that you have a framework, you have a process and looking at sure, your two main offers from what I remember is having that sort of debut, uh, duet debut, which is I think an audit, right? Sort of an audit of your existing, is uh, that correct? I have, so the, the audit is just its own thing. And then it, we oh, go into the duet debut. Yep, so the yes. duet debut is like right. the big one. Um, yes, but yeah, so exactly. the audit is like is figuring out like what is happening here? And where is it that we want to go? What would be the game plan for making that happen? And then the duet debut was actually executing on that. So that's the research, right. the strategy, the copywriting, yeah. which now I have confidence as a copywriter. I feel like we got to close that loop too. Guys, I am a copywriter, but it's, I've learned that as a copywriter, I write better because I have research and a strategy. That's what makes mm. me like, I don't just, I'm not, I'm not like, and I'm a creative person who sits down and writes for like, that's just not, I'm not that kind of writer. Um, I'm a marketer who can write <laughs> and can clarify mm. things. And then mm. we still do all the tech setup. But a huge reason why I can't do hourly either is because I'm developing a team too. Um, but value-based was important to me even before I had a VA helping me set up my documents or set up, you know, convert kit for a client. So that's, it, it makes even more sense once you get a team to not do hourly to make sure that you can cover yeah. your team's expenses. Yeah, definitely. And I do love how your both offers speak to each other because it's like, first of all, if you're not quite sure if you want to do an email nurturing sequence, it's let's just get a lay of the land about whether or not your marketing is working right now, you know? And so I think that is such a brilliant way of introducing your concepts and going, here's how things can improve, you know, on a sort of introductory offer. And then if you want us to implement those ideas for you, then we can debut together. Right. And
and so it's sort of I can I can see how that journey, you know, of planting the first seed of an audit and a lay of the land sort of session uh, into a, a bigger dating, <laughs> right? Yeah. Such, uh, you know, program that you're putting them into. Yeah. And that's actually what I learned in that really expensive incubator I was part of. That's like her say, you know, and so I'm like, okay, so it was worth it. Like I learned. Yeah. That. Yeah. She calls it basically like it's a paid proposal. So like, I'm not evaluating their stuff and then creating a custom proposal. I say this all the time. I'm like, the proposal is, is standard, but the work is not like right. the, the proposal might not be custom, but the work is like, be, and I've always, right. This is why my love of SOPs and project management and templates is like, because I have a solid list of what all needs to happen every time I'm the work is only getting better because I have this checklist. But if the projects were changing all the time, if like one week I'm doing this kind of sequence and then this kind of sequence, and then a Facebook ads, you know, like for all these clients, like I'm going to drop the ball where in reality, like I just get to make my two main services really clean um, and streamlined. And then I've actually created an intensive, which is basically <laughs> a mix of the audit, like doing what I call a roadmap. So it's for people who like come and they're like, they're willing to DIY a lot of it and they don't have a lot of emails up and running, but they want direction and they're willing mm. to create the content and set it up themselves. So this is where I'm like, my, my clients who come to me, it's usually like really clear which one they want. Like if they're like, just mm. do it for me, it's really clear. If people are like, I'm willing to do part of the work, Allie, just give me direction. Then I do the email strategy intensive. So I really craft out giving them a really good look at what they've got and, you know, their templates, their sequences and how it's set up. And then I give them a content strategy. Like, well, mm. here are your first 15 emails. And they're like, oh, thank God. I just didn't know what to write about. Or I don't know what topics to write about. And I'm like, oh, there are so many, but my brain just works that way. So I've had to just right. accept the fact that that's, that's part of my zone of genius is coming up with ideas and laying them out yeah. to make it really easy for someone else to implement. Yeah, I love that. And I love that those offers are all actually all the same thing. It's the same framework. The same it's just thing. that it's how they get that service, whether they do it, they fill in the blanks or they use your guide to do it on their own, or they just get you for a done for you, right? Sort of service. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's totally brilliant. Now, I want to sort of um, end this conversation in a little bit more of an educational piece about email marketing, because um, as new business owners and even seasoned business owners, like it is hard to juggle like email marketing, social media, podcasts about above above and there's like so many things that like the the act of trying to have consistent emails every week can feel daunting because of the fact that we're already showing up in so many different places so i kind of want to learn like why you think email marketing is different from the communication things that you do and relationships you build on this interesting social media realm and what's yeah. what's the difference and how and do we show up differently on social media versus email and why do you think email is kind of the number one asset <laughs> you know for every online business these days oh such great questions i've never been asked this before um so the first thing is that your email will outlive twitter it will outlive instagram and tiktok and whatnot um so that being said, you want to direct your traffic to your home base, which will be your email list. People say that you like own your list of subscribers. You don't own anyone, but you have access to them if you need them. Um, versus like if Instagram shut down or the algorithm screws with you, then you're not, your information's not being seen by anyone. Also, email is just like crazy powerful. You can't segment on Instagram. Like if you have an offer that's specifically for moms with toddlers, you can't hide that from people who are not moms with toddlers. It's going out to everyone and that's just noise. And that annoys me. So but with email, you can just target those people on your email list because you've segmented them and then you're going to get a better return on, you know, and then people who don't want to hear it don't have to hear it. So it's much more of a customizable platform as well. Um, but also it's automated. Like you can set up so much. And I'm not saying like you need to have 16 different funnels, but it's like if you can make sure that everyone is getting introduced to you in the best way, you can direct them back to your Instagram, but you want them on your email list because people don't change their email addresses very often, right? True. And you can always remove them. For cold subscribers, get them out of there. Like it's tanking your numbers and they're clearly not interested. So there's, yeah, there's, and it's interesting because it's not a vanity thing. It's not like I have 10,000 email subscribers. Like nobody's really talking about that. But on Instagram, everyone can see it and you're comparing and it's like, what is your relationship like with your list? Like I sent a survey to my list in January and I think I had like, 
12% of my subscribers complete like a 16 question survey. That's a commitment, but 12%, I'm like, oh my God, they love me. I have that many people. Well, like that's a good return on people filling out, you know? So like, that's how you can measure the health of things versus mm. just these vanity numbers. Um, what else? That's a lot of it. Did you have a follow-up question with that? Did I answer Well, anything? you know, would, would I, if I was to think about communication uh, styles or what do I talk about that's, you know, oh, different yeah. on my email list versus social media, which can be quite passive scrolling and liking mm -hmm. my posts when they haven't even read it, right? Like, so what, what, how would I show up differently, you know, with my email list versus what I'm putting on Instagram, for example? So super interesting is that not everyone who's on your Instagram is going to open your emails and not everyone who opens your emails is going to follow you on Instagram. Just repeat the same information. Be a freaking squeaky wheel. It doesn't matter because you're going to get known for something. Like I, I still don't run out of things to talk about with email marketing. And I'm not ashamed that like, yeah, this thing that's on Instagram came, like my Instagram captions get pulled from my emails. So um, yeah, like be known for something. Don't feel like you have to mix it up all the time. Like stay in your lane and be consistent. Um, for me, what I do is I think through like four different themes of content and I just rotate through those, but the topics are different. So mm. insider scoop, mine are the value of email marketing. So like why email marketing matters, um, email content. So suggestions on what to put in emails. Uh, one of those is like why you should use GIFs and here's how to make them like, right. Or, or why you shouldn't worry about things like using GIFs because people are like, are people going to think I'm unprofessional? I'm like, let them think you're unprofessional. You're human and you're fun and you're an online business owner. You can do whatever you want. Um, another one would be the technical side of things. So setting up segmentation. And then another one would be like a sales email. So even though most of my clients don't come, none of my clients have come through my email list. To be honest, the people who are my done for you clients, they're not out there joining email lists. And I'm aware of that. But I also need to practice promoting my offer, especially for the day that like, now that I have the email strategy intensive, which is a lot more accessible than my done for you offer, I have to know how to pitch myself. And that gets you in the habit of doing that. Right. But I just kind of repeat those same themes over and over again, but how I present that information or the actual topics will change. Mm, I love that. I love that you you picked four major pillars, you know, of yes. like, here's where I, I want to be known for these things and then where I can be flexible is sort of the topics within those pillars, right? Those mm -hmm. clusters of pillars. I do the same. I, I now use like my, my what I call like sort of my bread and butter content is my always, mm -hmm. always going to be the, the email because that's the meat, you know, yes. that's where everything is or it's my videos, but it still has an email that supports that promotion of that video. And then I just take little sound bites or little tidbits from elsewhere. the email and put it elsewhere because you're so yeah. right. Like people need repetitive like answers because it doesn't get in the first time the right, you know, it's all depends on how you said it and the minute they read it, what they were feeling and what they were doing when they were reading that piece. And it might be the fifth time that the concept lands for them, you know? Right. And so it's so true. Like people are so afraid to repeat themselves, but actually this is the gift for clients is to keep reminding them about what's important until they can embrace it, you know, as something right. that they want to live out, you know, and, and, and make sure that they have, um, now, if people want to find out more about how to um, go about setting up their email marketing and learning what that's about. And, you know, one of the things that I love about your style, uh, Ali, is that you, you have a great way of marrying the sort of nerdy technical bits of like, <laughs> here's how to set up. Cause I'm not technical. I'm so grandma, 85 years old when it comes to tech stuff, which makes me kind of discouraged to try new tools mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, but I love that you sort of show people how to do something very simply, nothing complicated, but you also kind of marry it with like, yeah, this is a technology tool, but let's not forget to be a goddamn human. And can you please let's, let's talk like a human. And so there's this really, and it's not what I see a lot, to be honest, like, oh. you know, in the email marketing space. And that's probably why I've been sort of like, oh, whatever, you know, I just sent out my emails. I'm not even going to think strategically about it, but you have sort of um, challenged me in a good way to kind of think about about a human relationship while using technical bits to support that experience rather than a funnel. I'm calling an experience now because funnel sounds so salesy and gross. Um, so if, if people want to learn how to build a nurturing experience for their audiences from different, you know, problem and pain points, where could they find out a resource from you that they can learn how to do this and potentially get your help in setting this up also? 
Absolutely. So the best way, and this is not just because I'm an email marketing person, but it would be my emails because that's where I share all this content. And I had uh, just a free strategy call with somebody on my list the other day. And she was like, I can't believe you give this all away for free. And I was like, I'm just like, I have nothing to sell right now for, you know, for cheap. <laughs> like, And so it's just out there for everyone. And the cool thing about joining on an email list too, is like, I'm not going to bombard you with too much. Like you get to slowly learn it all. You don't have to know it all today or tomorrow. Um, but yeah, you get to like gradually increase your confidence with email marketing and all of that content. If you're really interested is also on my blog because I'm big on repurposing. So if you really want to go search around on the blog, you can do that. Um, I have a lot of resources. If you're into tags and segmentations, that's one of my most popular right now. It has behind the scenes videos. The same gal was like, how did you not charge me for that? And I was like, because it takes time to put a dollar sign on something. Just take the PDF and run. Um, so grab that before I put a dollar sign on it. Um, but yeah, so I've got a lot of resources. I've duet.co slash resources. That would be the way to just, yeah, dive in on what would be most specific to you. And just remember too, that email marketing is sequential. Like how, how you take on email marketing is going to look different based on where you are in your business. So don't feel like you have to create a funnel overnight. Um, you also don't want to like just create emails and then have no way for anybody to get them, right? Like slowly build the castle, like walls, turrets, everything. Yep. If you just build one turret, it's not going to be a pretty castle. It's not going to protect you from anybody. So you got to like yeah, just learn bits and pieces of it and build it as you go. Um, my encouragement is that people want to hear from you. You have something valuable to share with them. And the longer you spent, you know, you spend being like, is my template perfect? Yada, yada. Like is one less person who's learning from you or being encouraged by you. So that's why I want you to be able to share what you know through email with confidence. Lovely. Well, we will put the links down on the show notes. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube and the descriptions, we'll also put it on the featured blog page for Ellie. Uh, it really is valuable and it is so true. She should be charging for it, but I'm not going to tell her that because um, it, I think the more magic, Ellie magic that people can experience that, you know, the more people are conversing and creating worthy conversations in the marketplace, right? That, that cannot be, a, yes. that has to be a good, a good ripple effect, I think, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So thank you for your generosity. Um, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a great conversation, so insightful about your life, how you make decisions and um, what business you're building that is in alignment with your genius zone and the lifestyle you want to have. I think that's a, such a great message to leave the audience with. So thank you, Ali, for coming on, on the show. Thank you. You asked really great questions. I enjoyed it. See you soon. See you.